Oh, it wasn't just Kenosha, Wisconsin that saw more looting and rioting and craziness last night. It wasn't just Wisconsin. Also spread to Minneapolis, which was, as we know, the city where the BLM movement had its rebirth as a result of the George Floyd arrest incident. But uh, last night, it got pretty ugly on the streets of Minneapolis. Looting, lots of arrests. What happened there? We have somebody who not only was there covering it, but also got a taste firsthand of what it's like when some elements of the BLM mob turn on you. Kyle Hooten is with us now. He is a reporter at The Daily Caller. He also contributes to Alpha News. Kyle, glad you're safe, man. Thank you for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me on. All right, so tell me what happened uh, first, that led up to all these incidents in people weren't even thinking about Minneapolis. It was all eyes focused on Kenosha, but Minneapolis got out of control, too. What led to this? What was the incident? Well, I was sitting at home following Kenosha and was very surprised to see that uh, civil unrest and riotous behavior had begun in Minneapolis after a man who was being pursued by police committed suicide at the Nicolette Mall. Uh, Looting and rioting quickly broke out at that mall, which is in the heart of downtown Minneapolis, within visual range of the new Viking Stadium. I made my way over there to the Nicolette Mall area to cover the activity, uh, where I found that police had largely secured the mall, but that rioting continued in other areas. As I was walking down the street about three blocks to the east of Nicolette Mall, a very upscale area, I was accosted by two individuals who took issue with the fact that I was wearing a bulletproof vest and carrying a backpack. Uh, One of the guys laid hands on me, grabbed me by my backpack strap and my vest, while the other guy grabbed my backpack from behind. In a tussle over my backpack, uh, the individual said, hey, man, hand me that gun. And the first guy lifted his shirt, revealing that he had a firearm tucked into his waistband. It was at that moment that I decided that uh, staying alive to keep reporting the news is probably more important than retaining my backpack. And I lost my pack, all my gear, and uh, my bulletproof vest. So you're there covering... The, the looting that breaks out now, it's looting in response to an Internet rumor of the police mm-hmm. murder of another unarmed black man. Turns well, out the not guy. Not even the police. Not, not, oh, not to, even to, the to police murder. Explain. Well, the guy killed himself. He was. Uh, oh, no, I know. But I'm saying the, the, yeah, initial, yeah. the initial storyline online, the initial story that was circling the fake news here was that police killed him, that he did not kill himself. So the, the right. looting starts in response to a fake story or rather a fake version of a story. And then you find yourself covering that looting. And how these two individuals did they uh, did they approach you at first to speak, uh, you know, to just sort of have a conversation with you? I mean, how did they accost you to engage in this armed robbery? Well, it was very interesting. I was walking down the street and uh, I was the only guy who was there on sort of official business. Everybody else seemed to be engaging in crime. And they took issue with the fact that I was a white man wearing a bulletproof vest. They said that white people have no business wearing bulletproof vests because, quote, you're not the ones getting shot. So that was sort of the initial uh, inciting incident. Wow. And uh, I'm assuming you spoke to police about this. And also, I would guess you've been talking to police sources about what happened last night. Uh, is, is there any do you have any sense from the Minneapolis PD that they even begin to have the resources to pay attention to an, an armed robbery of a reporter? Well, uh, you know, I sent them a message asking if I could give a statement, but a colleague of mine, Rebecca Brandon with Elsa News, was recently robbed, lost her phone and had a good deal of trouble getting in contact with law enforcement because they're so overburdened dealing with these other issues. So I'm going to continue pushing that rock, trying to get a get a statement uh, into the police. And I'm also going to be contacting the police regarding the uh, wave of death threats I've received following this incident. After I was robbed, I tweeted about it on Twitter.com. And uh, that tweet got some traction, which led to literally hundreds of messages in my inbox uh, saying that people want to kill me, saying that people uh, are trying to find my address. Many individuals also sent me pictures of themselves with guns, saying that they're going to kill me and my family. I'm very concerned about that as well. Kyle Hooten of the Daily Caller joining us now. He was at the Minneapolis, covering the Minneapolis looting last night. I saw video of a Saks Fifth Avenue uh, as it was broken into, and people were just very calmly and methodically working their way through what handbags and luggage pieces and designer belts and other things that they wanted. Kyle was robbed at gunpoint, and now he's just told us, I mean, Kyle, this is, this is really 
pretty mind blowing. You are robbed. You say that you were robbed at gunpoint. And there are strangers who respond to this by threatening to kill you. What do you how, try to explain to us what what the thinking is here? I mean, it, it doesn't even I think anyone hearing this would say that's just beyond insane. But what, what's the well, what's the thinking behind it? It seems to me that the criminal elements in Minneapolis don't really like reporters shining a light on their activities. You know, we've seen over the last couple of weeks uh, continued violence and aggression towards reporters who are trying to cover what's happening on the ground. And, uh, you know, they, they, they take our things, they rob us. I had a colleague who had her phone stolen. I had my gear stolen. And then they try to intimidate us over social media into, you know, stopping what we're doing. But we won't stop. We'll keep covering this and we'll keep exposing the violence and rampant crime in Minneapolis. Robbery is up 112 percent. Uh, auto theft is up 69 percent. The city is is falling apart. Did you get a chance to speak to just residents who obviously weren't involved in the looting and the rioting about what they think is going on in their city? People don't think of Minneapolis. I mean, as, as a New York City resident, you think of Minneapolis as one of these safe Midwestern cities where everyone's really nice and maybe even too polite to each other. What are the folks there that are living there right now feel like? Well, there's a lot of confusion. I know that some individuals have taken a hard line stance and have said that they will absolutely not let their homes get broken into. But there's also a lot of people that seem confused. Uh, you might have seen the report a couple of weeks ago in the New York Times where a neighborhood vowed not to call the police on criminals. There's been lots of statements given to various media outlets about people feeling guilty when they call the police to report a crime because Minneapolis is a very liberal city. So it seems like the population of Minneapolis is torn between their left-wing ideology that dictates that they don't call the police and their personal interest in not getting robbed and having their houses broken into. And the some of the video that was shown on social media last night, we're speaking to Kyle Hooten of The Daily Caller. He was covering the looting as it was happening in, in Minneapolis last night in response to a, a rumor, a fake story of police shooting an individual when the individual actually shot himself. Um, Kyle, uh, in the video, one thing I thought was really notable was that there are all these people who are breaking into, this is the Saks Fifth Avenue in, in downtown Minneapolis, so it's a very, yeah, very high-end, they're going after a very high-end department store. They actually want the goods inside, right? This isn't a, this is a, a directed, planned looting spree. This is not just, oh, there's a gas station, let's go grab a bunch of, you know, soda and, and, and Krispy Kremes or something. This is going after a very high end store. And what's what's notable and, and, and you were there. So I wanted to get a sense as to how much of this would would be true or how much of this was happening. You have people who are videotaping in real time. I mean, the looters are videotaping mm-hmm. their looting spree, which is, I think, so mm-hmm. remarkable to folks, because you would think we're, we're supposed to believe this looting is happening because people are so afraid of police and afraid of dealing with law enforcement, and particularly the African-American community, thinks they're being hunted by racist cops. Meanwhile, people are breaking into a store here with their cameras out like this is something they want to brag about on Instagram. Hey, look at me. I'm breaking into a store and stealing you know, a pair of shoes. Yeah, not only are they doing that, but there is actually a parking problem down at the Nicolette Mall. This is not a residential area. This is an upscale retail area with banks, businesses, and stores. And these individuals who were coming in to loot it while they were filming themselves doing it couldn't even find anywhere to park. The city was so overrun with individuals coming from surrounding neighborhoods, moving into uh, downtown Minneapolis, eager to steal things, that uh, there was traffic jams all around the riding. And yes, police were on site and they did secure a small area directly around Nicolette Mall near where that man killed himself allegedly, but uh, they were not able to extend their influence beyond that, and they were not able to prevent mobs of individuals from kicking in windows and loading their cars up with goods as they bragged about it and posted on social media, just like you identified. Kyle, the mayor of Chicago, Lori Lightfoot, earlier this month said that what was going on in her city where there was some looting that sounds very similar to this, where people actually coordinated the usage of vehicles as battering rams against storefronts in downtown Chicago to you know shatter the glass storefronts and then everyone could just run in and steal whatever they want. Lori Lightfoot referred to this as, as organized criminal activity, right? almost reminiscent of, yeah. of, a, of a mafia case or something, where people are, are coordinating beforehand 
Have you heard anything from the Minneapolis police or any of your sources there about how this? I mean, you said there were so many cars at the looting that the cars of the looters couldn't find. They, they couldn't find places to park them. Uh, did did yeah. they see? Was there just like a Facebook post of, hey, everybody, show up to this place and let's steal all the stuff we want? Well, it's unclear exactly how this stuff is organized, but I've seen screenshots from various Facebook group chats. I've seen screenshots from different group me group chats and Twitter group chats of individuals coordinating in the fashion that you alluded to. But again, it's very difficult to pin down exactly how these people operate because while they're organized, they're not always public about how they're organizing. One time I went undercover at a BLM march here in Minneapolis. And when I was doing that, I, I saw a little bit more of how the organizational structure works. They had individuals who were sort of commanders, and then those individuals had people underneath them that were giving directions to the crowd. And then they had a group of individuals on motorcycles that were pulling security, and the BLM protesters were told to refer to those individuals if they have some sort of problem or an altercation with the conservative or the police. So it's very clear that there's an organized structure here, and it's very clear that they're communicating. I saw it firsthand. Exactly how that communication occurs is a little bit more difficult to identify. Kyle Hooten of The Daily Caller. Kyle, please keep in touch with us. Let us know as you continue to show us what's going on. Minneapolis is not going to calm down anytime soon. You stay safe. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on. A fatal shooting in Kenosha, Wisconsin. We had our fourth night of riots there, all based on the incomplete at best story of the the uh, killing of I'm sorry, the shooting, not killing the shooting of Jacob Blake. And now we have an, a situation that did end in loss of life. And we have Kyle Rittenhouse, a 17 year old Illinois resident who is now all all over the Internet. Everyone's weighing in on who he is, what he did, what he. He has been charged with first-degree intentional homicide in connection with shootings that left two people dead on Tuesday night. Uh, Rittenhouse, this guy's just 17 years old. There's, there are images of him cleaning up graffiti before this happened. Th- these are things that the mainstream media, if they report on, will always be in like, you know, the very small subtext somewhere deep in an article. They're not going to raise this so people really take this into account because... The difference between self-defense, and this is very important, the difference between self-defense and murder in situations like this is all really a question of narrative. It's a question of what are the what is the totality of the facts? No one's disagreeing that he discharged a rifle that killed two people. There's no disagreement about that. So it's all what led up to that. Why did he do that? Was he in fear? Was he justified in taking those actions as part of uh, self-defense. Well, he had posted on social media accounts support for Blue Lives Matter and Humanize the Badge, which is a nonprofit that he ran, uh, a nonprofit, rather, he ran a Facebook fundraiser for on his 16th birthday, according to the New York Times. He liked to pose with guns, and he liked guns, but that's, for the tens of millions of people in America who are, who are lawful gun owners, it's, it's a cultural thing. It's a Second Amendment thing. I mean, there's a lot posing with guns. I, mean, I have plenty of photos of me with guns all over the place. Not, not in New York, because I can't have them here, but certainly in my earlier life. Um, yeah, one day, I'll, just for fun, I'll post. You know, I got all, all kinds of stuff from back in the day, back in the agency days with, with weapons. But that's not in any way indicative of anything, right? But these are just, this is some of the backstory. He was cleaning up graffiti before the shootings took place. So he's one of these people that believes in, in trying to counteract the destruction in the neighborhoods. That's also on the record. There's photo of him doing that. So there's evidence that, he's done, that he was doing that. It is believed that he said he was supportive of the right to protest and that he was actually, he told people there that he was on the side of protesters, but he would not allow looting. Now he's 17 years old. You're going to have a lot of discussion about that too. You know, yes, 17 is very young, but 17 is also the age that people, uh, some people who join the Marine Corps are 17. Some people who see combat are, or sign up to go into combat are, are 17. So 
you know, that's he's going to be treated as an adult here. And there are circumstances legally and otherwise where a 17 year old would be treated as an adult. And uh, about two hours before the first shooting. Rittenhouse is at a Kenosha vehicle dealership. And he talks, he identifies himself as Kyle and he's talking to them. So so he's discussing why he's there. There's a, a lot of, you know, back and forth over what his real motivations were. What you're going to hear from the lib media about this is that this young white man with a rifle. Um, and he did he cro- he crossed from Illinois into Wisconsin with the rifle. I I don't know, you know, if, if he broke if he broke any statutes with the firearm. I don't know. Um, I'd have to dig into uh, Illinois and Wisconsin law on this one. But I, I do know, you know, usually unless there's a reciprocity agreement or something, usually you can't cross state lines with a with a firearm. So. But again, that would be something that he's he's charged with first degree murder. OK, that's the issue. Let's 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 drill down on onto that for right now. Uh, there are there's two shootings that he's he's involved in. And there are other people, other rioters who had weapons. That's clear as well. In one instance, here's the first shooting is written about the, the TikTok of The New York Times. While Ritten, Rittenhouse is being pursued by a group, an unknown gunman fires into the air. Unclear why. The weapon's muzzle flash appears in footage filmed at the scene. Mr. Rittenhouse turned towards the sound of gunfire as another pursuer lunges toward him from the same direction. Mr. Rittenhouse then fires four times and, a shoot, and, and appears to shoot the man in the head. If you assault somebody who has a gun in their hands... If you try to use force against somebody who has a gun in their hands, it is generally speaking, unless they are committing a crime against you, meaning, you know, if someone's robbing you and you use force to try to get the gun out of their hands, then you have a justification for it. But if you just don't like someone and you try to wrestle them and they have a gun and you get shot, that's a very unwise decision to make to try to wrestle the person with the gun or attack them or shoot them, which may have also been the case based on the handgun muzzle flash that we see in the footage. The way this is being reported, though, is that, and, and even if Democrat politicians have weighed in, they are claiming that a 17-year-old white guy who shot two white rioters, one of whom was armed at the time and attacking him, that this is evidence of white supremacy and systemic racism, and that this guy is a white nationalist. Based on no evidence whatsoever. One thing you keep seeing when these incidents happen that get all this attention, when these incidents happen that BLM riots over, is people coming forward to explain the legalities of this or the criminality of it and to talk about self-defense, to talk about who don't know anything, who have no idea what the heck they are talking about and who will ask really stupid questions, ask them rhetorically as though they're making a really profound point. And here's a perfect example. There's now an effort to compare Jacob Blake and the way he was treated by police with uh, Kyle Rittenhouse. Right there. There's this effort to say, well, why, why did Kyle Rittenhouse shoot two people, three people killed two of them, but was not killed by was not shot by police. And Jacob Blake was as if this is a, an intelligent comparison without understanding a whole lot of other things that were going on here. Here is Trevor Noah, who doesn't even really try to be funny anymore. First of all, he was never funny. This was just, oh, the, the libs were like, oh, we're going to make this guy into a comedy star. He's not funny. He's never been funny. His show sucks. And I mean, he's paid a ton of money to, you know, just to sort of be there. You know, he's paid a ton of money to be the guy that took over John Stewart. Look, John Stewart was a dishonest, smug propagandist, but he was clever. He was pretty funny sometimes. And Trevor Noah is out there saying uh, things like this. Play clip nine. That's right. Last night, some guy decided to drive to Kenosha with his militia buddies to protect a business. 
and apparently ended up shooting three people and killing two. But don't worry, the business is okay. And let me tell you something. No one drives into a city with guns because they love someone else's business that much. That's some bull****. No one has ever thought, oh, it's my solemn duty to pick up a rifle and protect that TJ Maxx. They do it because they're hoping to shoot someone. That's the only reason people like him join these gangs in the first place. And yes, I said it, a gang. Enough with this militia bull****. This isn't the Battle of Yorktown. It's a bunch of dudes threatening people with guns. And while what happened with those shootings last night is tragic, what happened afterwards is illuminating. Because it made me wonder. It really made me wonder why some people get shot seven times in the back, while other people are treated like human beings and reasoned with and taken into custody with no bullets in their bodies. That's really easy, Trevor Noah. Rittenhouse threw up his arms and surrendered to police. It's on video. And whether you're dealing with a, a mass shooter somewhere or you're dealing with you know gang violence or whatever it is, when a person no longer poses a threat to law enforcement, they will not shoot that person. Right? You, you, could, you could be the mastermind of 9-11 if you are, well, not a good example because that was overseas and the military was involved, but you could be the mastermind of a terrorist operation on U.S. soil and if you throw down, you know, you throw down your AK-47 or whatever, and you throw your hands up and say, okay, I give in, they're going to take you into custody. You could be a guy who's wanted for, you know, writing illegal checks, but if the, you wrestle the cops and then they draw their weapons on you and you say, I've got a gun or I've got a knife, I'm going to go for it. And you go for it. They're going to shoot. That's the difference. Doesn't matter who you are, what your skin color is, what you look like. That is the difference. It's about imminent threat. This is how police are trained. And when you think through these issues, it makes sense. A person who is no longer a threat should not be met with lethal force by police. A person who is a threat is going to be met with lethal force by police. That's the way that they're trained. That's the way that what's the alternative? It's amazing to me to see all these people are saying, why didn't they just grab, uh, why didn't they just grab Jacob Blake and, and wrestle him to the ground? They already tried, and he was going for a knife. So do the police have to wait? To, do the police have to wait till maybe one of them gets stabbed in the neck? Do they have to wait until they watch their partner get, you know, slashed across the throat and maybe bleed out there on the street before they can take action? The Democrats seem to think the answer is yes. That seems to be their point of view on this one. And as for the, the whole storyline here that why would you go and defend someone else's business? Now, I, I, I will say this. If, if uh, Rittenhouse was a friend of mine, a member of my family, I would say don't do it. I would say don't do it because of exactly what happened here. Uh, you're going to put yourself in a situation where, you know, y- you, you may have to make decisions that you're not trained for. That you're, it's one thing to defend your own home, your own business. And I'm not saying I can't appreciate the, the moral impulse to try to help those who are defenseless, don't have weapons, but I'm just saying I understand how the legal system works in this country, and I understand how public opinion works in this country. And showing up across state lines to defend someone else's business, you're going to put yourself in a much more challenging position if you have to use force. Look, there's a reason why people have concealed carry insurance. There's a reason why people take these... Uh, take these steps beforehand because they know and everyone that I know who's a real gun guy or gal out there knows if you ever have to use your weapon, that's a choice that you're going to make that you better be damn sure and you better be prepared for negative consequences even if you are 100% morally in the right. People, are, Some of you are probably thinking around a buck. What are you talking about? Come on, that can't. Oh, no, that's true. You, know, you shoot you shoot somebody who is robbing you, and then he sues you civilly, and says you didn't have to shoot me. All you have to do is convince convince a jury that the preponderance of the evidence is that he you didn't have to shoot him. That you could have just drawn your weapon and he would have stopped. But no, you drew your, you drew your weapon during let's say an armed robbery and you shot somebody, and now the the jury awards him five million dollars. Yeah, that's the re- and now I know you're saying well that's not fair exactly. You gotta be very careful with these circumstances. You have to really understand whether or, or, you know, or if you're in a situation you have to pull your weapon, defend yourself, 
you shoot somebody and, you know, the round either goes through them or maybe the round goes just a little up and, and it hits somebody a, a block away, you're totally liable for that. Right. So you don't want to put yourself in a situation where you have to use your weapon. Anyone who really understands the law and understands firearms knows that. So while I can understand the impulse here, and I think it was a good impulse to try to protect those who are being attacked. You put yourself in a very precarious circumstance. Um, but now that's for the weapons charges and lesser things on the first degree murder charge. If you can't protect yourself, I don't I mean, it doesn't matter, you know, what what the circumstances of the individual's reasons for being in this state are or anything else. If someone's allowed to attack you and they can have a gun in their hands and you have a weapon and you're not allowed to shoot them, there's what is self-defense doctrine? Now, I'm not saying 100 percent Rittenhouse is going to get going to get off with self-defense, but to call it murder one, first of all, is, is complete. That's just overcharging for political reasons. And it's absurd. Manslaughter, maybe murder one is outrageous. But they do that on purpose to put Rittenhouse on defense right away and to send a signal to the mob. This is what will happen. This is what will happen to you. Um, if you stand up to the mob, that's what they want you to know. Uh, this young man, I think, would would probably, if he could, he would have a, a do over with all of this and uh, not not show up because they're, they're going to attach the word vigilante to him. And, you know, it's again, defending your own home, castle doctrine, defending your own property, showing up to defend someone else's property. I, I a lot of you are not going to want to hear this, but I'm just telling you, it is it is a le- from a legal perspective. You're you're going to be in a riskier place because public opinion will push the law. And that's what we see happening here. Again, different thing. You're standing outside your own in the McCloskey's, even the, the DA there. And no, of course, nobody was hurt. So it was a lot easier. But the DA there even had to back off. No, no. You know, mob outside your home. If you can't stand outside your home and guard your home, then there's no such thing as the right to self-defense. And the Second Amendment is effectively null and void. But I, I think you're going to ha- it's going to be a tougher situation here for Rittenhouse on at least some of the charges. They're going to try to put him in prison for as much as they can. I don't think they'll get him on murder one, but depending depending on some of the weapons issues here, you know, that's going to get. And then the civil suits that he's going to face. This is why I I wish this young I wish this young man. Look, and I know that not everything I say here in the show you'll agree with. I just wish this young man had stayed home. Because his life is um, in real in real jeopardy right now. And there are two people who died who we're starting to see from the video were themselves engaged in violence and criminal acts. And that's that that much is clear. Um, but this was a tragedy that should have that should have been avoided. It should have been avoided by political leadership deploying the necessary law enforcement resources to stop the rioting and the looting. But they weren't willing to do that. Not until it was too late. How is it possible to call yourself a Republican and support this lunatic left wing Democrat ticket? I I just want to know how anyone can really think with a straight face. How do you do that? Well, there have been plenty of them. I see now we have a hundred former McCain campaign alumni or something like that. I think it's McCain camp are all coming out saying they support Biden. Who gives a crap? McCain got crushed by Obama, crushed. And he was a guy that was representative of the old GOP way of just trying to go along to get along, lose gracefully, and let the progressive libs just continue to steamroll people and start a lot of wars and a lot of things you don't need to do overseas, send young men to fight and die for wars. We're not even clear what the heck we're doing there. That was the old GOP. Then Trump came along. He's like, you know what? I got a different idea. I got a different approach. Oh, no, we have to hear from, and this one, I have to say, was moderately disappointing. I don't think anybody really cares. Carly Fiorina throwing her, uh, her support behind Biden. Ooh, play 13. 
hurtful look. Let me be very clear. Uh, I voted for President Trump in 2016. He has lost my support because I think he has failed to lead when the country needed leadership. I am therefore voting for Joe Biden. It is a binary choice, our presidential elections, but I'm not a Democrat. And I think that one of the key reasons uh, that I'm voting for Joe Biden is because I think we need collaboration and problem solving. I think we need people from different political points of view. It's kind of like these frauds at the Lincoln Project, <laughs> just raising all this money from libs to uh, make attack ads against Trump because they don't like him, but mostly to pay themselves a lot of money. Yeah, that's what they're that's what the real Republicans do. Help elect the radical Democrat Party that's trying to destroy what these whether it's the Lincoln Project, or these other Republicans, these former McCain staffers, or Steve Schmidt and these other morons out there uh, try to destroy what they claim to have been fighting their whole adult lives to support, right? Destroy that Republican Party, sure. People, I, I, I hope no one, no matter what happens this election, I hope that it is, it remains um, never forgotten who turned their back, not just on Trump, on conservatism, on Republicanism at this time. You know, when it was just uh, either economically, financially useful to them or socially, you know, that now's a time when you can switch sides and people, they'll pat you on the head. Oh, you're a former Rep- or you're a Republican that's turning against Trump. Gee, and the media will give you you'll do a few interviews on Morning Joe and they'll say, oh, gosh, you know, your courage, everything else. And then the moment you walk out the door, they're spitting at you saying, what a clown, what a loser, what a jerk. What a turncoat. Never worth it. You know, your dignity, your honor, these are things that only you can give away. And people in the Lincoln Project and former Republican candidates for president, you know, John Kasich, and that guy's a, that guy's a loser times 10. So since I've been able to share my thoughts on that, now let's hear from somebody who's not a loser and hopefully going to win again at the national level, Vice President Pence, who pointed out uh, last night when he was accepting the nomination to run and serve as vice president of the United States. Here's what he said about where the Democrats are on all this. Play 16. But in the midst of this global pandemic, just as our nation had begun to recover, we've seen violence and chaos in the streets of our major cities. President Trump and I will always support the right of Americans to peaceful protest. But rioting and looting is not peaceful protest. Tearing down statues is not free speech. And those who do so will be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. Last week, Joe Biden didn't say one word about the violence and chaos engulfing cities across this country. So let me be clear. The violence must stop, whether in Minneapolis, Portland, or Kenosha. Too many heroes have died defending our freedom to see Americans strike each other down. We will have law and order on the streets of this country for every American of every race and creed and color. So that's one political party. That's one leader of a political party here who is letting everybody know where he stands, what the dividing line is here. How could anyone oppose that? Democrats do. They don't like to say it out loud very much. They don't like to admit it, but Democrats do oppose it. Why is that? What's going to happen if Joe Biden wins? Vice President Pence last night at the RNC told us what we should expect, even if Biden, who now has said a kind of a tepid criticism of the riots and looting and arson and craziness, but that's not going to make anything better for anyone. Because, well, play 17. When you consider their agenda, it's clear. Joe Biden would be nothing more than a Trojan horse for the radical left. The choice in this election has never been clearer, and the stakes have never been higher. Last week, Joe Biden said, democracy's on the ballot. And the truth is, our economic recovery is on the ballot. Law and order are on the ballot. But so are things far more fundamental and foundational to our country. In this election, it's not so much whether America will be more conservative or more liberal, more Republican or more Democrat. The choice in this election is whether America remains America. 
It's whether we will leave to our children and our grandchildren a country grounded in our highest ideals of freedom, free markets, and the unalienable right to life and liberty, or whether we will leave them a country that's fundamentally transformed into something else. That's the choice that faces this country. And it's one that I'm feeling better about now in terms of what's going to end up happening every day. But who knows, friends? This is a fight to the finish, no matter what shields high. 